Daily life for a farmer like me is never dull. There's always 101 jobs to do around the farm, and like most of us, I have lots of unexpected decisions to make each day. So, Charlotte, do you want a coffee or do you want tea? <laughs> when I go about my daily life, I decide what I do and when I do it. I like to think of myself as an individual. At least, that's how it's always seemed, until now. New evidence reveals something surprising. We humans think and move like members of a herd in more ways than we might realise. One Direction! We can now create a remarkable new picture of our lives. Because every time we travel, use our phones, credit cards or visit a supermarket, we leave a trail of information. We capture every single transaction that every individual makes in every single store, every moment of every day. When we analyse this mountain of data, it reveals one of the most powerful influences in our daily lives. The temperature. And it only needs to change by the smallest degree to affect us both physically and psychologically. In fact, when the temperature drops, our appetite increases, our mood alters and our health suffers in many precise and surprising ways. Oh, God, it makes me want to do a wee. <laughs> Analysis of the data we generate in our daily lives means that scientists can now monitor, predict and even manipulate our actions. If the sun was out, you'd see massive increase in sales. I'm going to find out why we react in similar ways and how temperature can make us act not as individuals, but as a collective mass, a human swarm. Last winter began with a cold snap in October and heavy snowfalls across the country in January. This sharp fall in temperature had an obvious impact as we struggled to keep warm and get to work. The winter was followed by the coldest March for 50 years. On the night of the 17th of March this year, the temperature fell sharply over much of the UK, from 7 to 1 degree centigrade. This obviously had an effect on our gas and electricity consumption. Every morning between 6 and 8am, when we're all getting up and getting ready for the day, the networks are prepared for a surge in energy. In a cold spell like this March, households in the UK consume nearly 20% more gas and electricity than usual. When all 63 million of us cook hot breakfast and turn up the heat at the same time, this causes our household carbon emissions to increase sharply. In the winter, they go up by 14%. When you add that to the emissions for the rest of the year, it's enough to build a solid block of carbon weighing 20 million tonnes and over a 1,000 feet high. So tall, it would tower over London's highest buildings. It's information like this that unlocks new evidence to show we act together as a human swarm. The Met Office in Exeter tracks temperature changes across the UK, 24 hours a day. It houses one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, capable of 100 trillion calculations a second. The computer collects temperature and weather data and handles the forecast for the whole country. It is this data that reveals we act like a swarm.
I don't know about you, but when the temperature drops, I like to warm the car before I go to work. And like most people, I leave the engine running while I scrape the ice off the windscreen. And I'm not alone. In cold temperatures, more of us use our cars for shorter journeys than we would normally make. Once we're on the move, the engine has to work harder than normal. The cold makes the oil thicker, and the engine needs a richer mixture of fuel and air. The cold also lowers the pressure in the tyres, which in turn increases the friction with the road and so requires more power from the engine. When temperatures drop below 10 degrees, we use 43% more fuel in the first mile of our journey. Every winter, this costs you and me an extra 1,400 million pounds. On a morning like this, when it's absolutely freezing, I could really do with a bacon sandwich. But what I want to find out is when it gets cold, what does everyone else want for breakfast? Let's ask the question on Twitter. It's an instant way to get feedback. I wonder what my followers are thinking. Social media, credit card transactions, texts and our mobile phones all provide insight into our mood and actions minute by minute. The world creates 2.5 billion gigabytes of data every day. That's equal to 67.5 billion Encyclopedia Britannicas. Time to find out what my followers are having for breakfast. Just some humble toast and yoghurt. Bubble and squeak with poached eggs. I'm halfway through a bacon sandwich right now. Fish wrapped in bacon with leftover roast veg. I'm in the Alps and having orange juice, tea, all brand. Don't care about you, you're on holiday. Porridge with nuts and dried fruits, nutmeg on top. Then back to bed as I'm stuffed. Let's compare my Twitter feed with the sales information from a coffee shop. What would be your dream breakfast? It will be like a farm chocolat. Perfect. <laughs> but you've gone for porridge. Why have you gone for porridge? Okay, it fills me up, nice and warm. Thank you very Cheers. much. Is there any reason why you've chosen that for breakfast? No. Uh, I've had breakfast. This is my second breakfast. <laughs> Yeah. So why do you feel like more breakfast now? Because it's cold and I fancy something warm yeah. and porridgey and filling. Although we all ordered breakfast according to our individual preferences, the overall picture is that humans act in a very similar way to a swarm. Stores like this sell 44% more porridge every day in a cold week. Quaker Oats sell 200% more than normal, a staggering 20 million packets of the stuff each week. Some people are choosing porridge and saying it's because it's cold outside. Other people are saying, well, no, don't think it's the weather, just chosen it. That might not be the case. Our appetites are driven by something hidden deep inside us. Dr. Mark Hetherington is an environmental psychologist. OK, Jimmy, so the easiest way to explain why people uh, eat more food in cold weather is for you to uh, take some of your clothes off. OK. So, I mean, what's the temperature now? Temperature, what it must be... Oh, well, two or three degrees? Two or three degrees. So, quite quickly, you should see the heat dissipate from my body. Yeah, you should see your skin temperature start to fall. Whoa. So what can you see getting cold first? What's the first thing you pick up on the camera? Your fingers are starting to look blue on, on the uh, thermal image. So when they're nice and warm, what colour are they? White, red, orange is warm, and then we drop down through green and blue and eventually to black. Black's generally not good. Not good, but my fingers are blue at the moment, are they? They're a greeny blue colour. See, I feel already, I can feel the cold air going round my fingers, so I can feel these getting cold. I can feel it round my arms. Mm -hmm. But I must say, nose is getting cold as well. Yeah. Nerves will take the information from your skin to an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. This is where our biology kicks in. 
The hypothalamus is a tiny gland in the very center of the brain, which acts as the body's thermostat. It keeps the body's core temperature at a constant 37 degrees. To prevent heat loss when it gets cold, the hypothalamus sends instructions to constrict blood vessels in the extremities of our body. As our bodies get colder, it makes muscles shiver to generate heat. When the hypothalamus detects the cold, it makes us all want to take on more food. Food has what's known as a thermic effect. To digest the food takes energy, and some other energy is released as heat. When it's cold, most of us crave hot food. The surprising thing is that although we need food, it doesn't have to be hot. Any food will do, even a salad. If you were living in a cave in prehistoric times, then you would probably need all the extra energy from the extra food you've eaten just to keep warm. But we don't really live in a cold environment anymore. We live in temperature-controlled buildings, so our cold exposures are relatively short. Unfortunately, they're long enough to stimulate the appetite, but they're not long enough to burn off all the extra energy. We get cold for a short period of time, eat extra food, then go and sit in the office and then put on the old fat. Yes. When the temperature drops by a few degrees, our food consumption goes up. But the data reveals something much more disturbing. And that is, whenever the temperature falls, even by one degree, oh, it has a deep and powerful impact on our health. We like to think of ourselves as individuals, but when the temperature falls, we all act as one human swarm. Now, everything we do can be mapped. Every flight we take is tracked. This is a GPS map of all the flights in Europe starting up. Every train journey can be plotted. This shows our activity in rush hour. Even the pictures we take with our phones can be analyzed. This is the nation mapping their own streets. Other social network feeds, credit cards, consumer sales and government services all create huge amounts of data about our lives. When scientists combined all this with weather information, they discovered something surprising. That even very small temperature changes have a deep effect on our health. In December 2012, the temperatures dropped to zero. And during that winter, an extra 669,000 of us ended up in A&E. Of course, it's not surprising that when the snow fell, so did we. That December, more patients came to the hospital's fracture clinic than any other time of the year. A total of 677,239 visits. The latest research shows that just the smallest drop in temperature has hidden effects on our biology. Scientists crunched the data from 84,000 hospital admissions and matched them with the temperature records across the country. When they looked at the data over a three-year period, they discovered something extraordinary. For every one degree drop in the UK's temperature, there was an extra 200 heart attacks. The idea that just a one degree drop in temperature can cause an extra 200 heart attacks is amazing. The question is, why? At London's Royal Free Hospital, Dr. Gavin Donaldson and his bucket of ice has the answer. Well, when you go outside, or when you expose to cold temperatures, your blood vessels constrict to keep heat in your body. And I can show you, if you put your hand underneath this imaging device... That here? Uh, yes, yeah, turn it the other way around. Uh -huh. and you'll see that it measures blood flow in your skin. 
Right, I see. So that's my hand here. And the, the redder it is, the more blood flow is flowing through that part of the hand. So that's quite normal at the moment, then? That's quite normal at the moment. And if you put your hand now into this bowl of iced water... That's cold. Oh. It makes me want to do a wee. Yeah. <laughs> so now if you put your hand back under the camera... You should see that your hand is much bluer yeah, and there's less blood flow going through it. You see it really, really blue. You can see it start to change as it starts to warm up again. Um, yeah, and more blood starts to go through the constricted blood vessels. And the reason that causes heart attacks is as your skin blood vessels constrict, it pushes blood into the centre of your body and it causes an overload and you react to try and get rid of this excess fluid one by producing more urine which is why you might want to go to the toilet more in cold weather and two by uh, moving water from the circulation into the tissues so when it gets cold are you saying that our blood gets thicker yes it becomes more viscous so if you get something like a milkshake that's harder to suck up a straw oh, yeah. than just water yeah and it's like it's more like tomato ketchup it's slower to move across the plate So for every one degree the temperature drops, our blood thickens, and that makes it more likely to clot. This thickening of the blood can be enough to trigger a heart attack in a vulnerable person. Cold weather has many other effects on our health, and something I've always wondered why is it we get the flu when it's cold? I'm making a new show for Channel 4 and I need to know your thoughts. Maybe because we all stay indoors, more heating on, huddled with others, prime breeding ground for germs. Lifestyle changes in habits, less air ventilation, heating on, doors closed. We aren't tough enough anymore. Public transport. Higher temperature from central heat inside homes, causing a breeding ground for nasty bugs. When you combine health and Met Office data, it appears that on cold days, there's a hot spot for flu viruses. And that is schools. He's always got colds, I don't know why. I've been back to the doctors. It does happen, no one gets it, and then the old class has got it. Why do you think they're so prevalent in winter? Why? Because people don't wrap up warm, that's why. What if I told you none of this is true? Professor Wendy Barclay of Imperial College is an expert on the spread of viruses. So we're here in a playground. It looks a picture of happiness, but in fact, is it just a whole pool of disease, flu, and, and, and things like that, snotty noses. Well, undoubtedly some of these children are infected at the moment with flu virus. Children we know are major spreaders of those viruses. They get very easily infected by them. So one of those out there could actually be passing it on to us right now. The reason flu spreads in cold weather is down to our biology. Flu viruses live inside us. When we breathe out, we can spread the virus to another person. Viruses are fragile. In the summertime, they are broken down in the air by the heat and the light of the sun. Now here's a surprising fact. In the winter, when the temperature is lower, the flu virus can survive in the cold air for longer. Children are more likely to catch flu because their immune systems are less robust. In cold weather, it's easier for viruses to pass in and out of our bodies. This is because the hairs in our nose become more brittle in the cold and are less able to filter out the germs. These clever viruses managed to infect 20% of the UK's population this winter. Over 12 and a half million of us got the flu. Is there anything we can do to try and prevent it? Most children don't have enough vitamin C and that's why it is. Right. We know vitamin C is, is good for fighting colds. Why more vitamin C then? Uh, that's what you're always told, isn't it? More vitamin C keeps colds away. And that's what we all do. This January, when the temperatures dropped below freezing, the sale of vitamin C skyrocketed. 
one supermarket sold almost 20% more vitamins. Eat lots of oranges, plenty of vitamin C. That's, that's obvious, right? That helps. Not really. There isn't really any good hard and fast scientific study that shows that taking vitamin C really makes any difference to your chances of catching a cold or to your outcome once you've got a cold. Even so, the swarm spends £36 million a year on vitamin C. However, our collective actions online may in the future help us to track the outbreak of diseases as they happen. New ways of combining weather information, health data, social network sites and our internet searches could help doctors to stop the spread of illness. Websites such as sickweather.com scan publicly available online data for phrases associated with being unwell and then match these to the geographical location of the user. These animations show the location of outbreaks of flu across the UK this winter. Another website collects the data from online searches to map the spread of viruses around the world. It might seem far-fetched, but when you compare searches online for words related to flu to actual cases reported, the two overlap. The search engine matches the health data. At the moment, the NHS don't use these websites to predict the spread of illnesses. The hope is that in the future, health authorities will use this live flow of data to help target immunisation programmes and contain the outbreak of disease. And one day, we could all be watching the virus forecast. And now for the forecast. Although flus are on their way out, they're still on the top list of illnesses that can sweep across the country. And of course, there are plenty of colds around. Down here in the southwest, we're seeing a lot of allergies. And up here in the northeast, there have been reports of stomach viruses, which have probably come over from the continent. And that is something to keep an eye out for next week. At the Met Office in Exeter, the data analysis is becoming more sophisticated and more accurate. Scientists here collect data from around the globe, from an amazing array of sources, from weather balloons, deep sea sensors and even commercial aircraft. This information is fed into a computer model of the planet, which can predict our weather down to one and a half square kilometres. These detailed forecasts help hundreds of companies run their businesses more effectively. Dave Britton is a senior meteorologist at the Met Office. Weather affects all of us on a day-to-day -day basis, but perhaps more importantly, it affects all of us at the same time. Businesses want to know what the weather's going to do in quite a lot of detail, so they can then make planning decisions, whether it's soup in a supermarket um, or, or sledges or snow shovels in a DIY store. It's really about making sure that you have the time to move the stock you might have in a warehouse to the appropriate stores and the logistics of that, of making sure it's in the right place at the right time. When businesses combine the Met Office data with their own sales figures, the result is quite extraordinary. When the temperature changes, these companies know what we want to buy, even before we do. At this supermarket distribution centre in Yorkshire, Ross Eggleton is in charge of its national transport. We basically capture every single transaction that every individual makes in every single store, every moment of every day. And if you overlay that then with what the weather conditions were outside at the time they made the purchase, it obviously gives you a lot of information and data that you can then use to build a picture of what those patterns are going to be the next time it's, you know, it's snowing in Aberystwyth. Yeah. It's normally when there's a sudden and dramatic shift in weather, they're the hardest to predict. It's that switch and how people react that really can create a spike in demand. So how many different items have you got in this warehouse? In this particular uh, warehouse, there's over 9,000 different products. This warehouse is the biggest in the UK and covers 1.2 million square feet. 
Three and a half million food cases are sent from here to supermarkets around the country every week. When temperatures plummet and the country's appetite changes, this place has to change its output quickly. It's a fine balancing act. They have to make sure there are enough of the right items on the shelves to meet the customer's new demands, and yet not too many items that will then be left unsold. If we can flow the product exactly where we need it at exactly the time somebody wants to buy it, we are as efficient as we can be. And data is key to both of those. Absolutely. When the weather changed this winter, this supermarket was able to match the weather forecast with the last five years of sales data. Their ordering system was able to predict what we wanted to eat and automatically sent instructions to the warehouse. Here, a secret army of people make sure the right food is in stores whenever we want it. A computer voice activated system tells them what products to pick for delivery to each local store. Repeat. And I want to have a go. Bay 205. Down there. Go get them. There's a central computer and it tells me uh, what bay to go down and what area we've got to go and pick the products from. That's the aisle. What have I got to tell her now? No, you just say, OK. OK. Repeat. It's not recognising my voice. You say it. Six, five. Pick one. Pick one. See, basically, um, I haven't got a Yorkshire accent, so it doesn't recognise me. <laughs> Six, five. Repeat. 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 Five, two. Five, two. Pick one. Six, five. Six, five. Four, two. Repeat. I can't do it in your accent. Four, two. Pick one. There we go. Now, I probably slowed you up a bit. Just a bit. Just a bit. It, it's a better way because usually you can't make mistakes this way. Right. It's almost surreal. This guy's talking to someone you can't see. One. He's getting the orders, and all you can hear him say is, repeat, one, two, got one, and off he goes again. But all this information is coming from a computer, and it's been fed by the store saying, we need this, we need that. And it all is really governed by what we want to buy. And if it's cold, we're going to buy a lot of soups. It's two degrees outside today. And because we respond together just like a swarm, the supermarkets can predict with certainty that there will be a sharp rise in the demand for warming winter foods. The lorries are loaded with porridge, soup, heavy sauces, ready-made meals, and all the ingredients that make stock and stews. And because of the flu, tissues. This year was the coldest Easter weekend ever recorded in the UK. We all responded to the hypothalamus deep inside our brains. When we went to the supermarkets, we bought 15% more hearty ready meals. and a staggering 246% more pies than on a normal weekend. And it wasn't just the sales of certain foods that went up. Cat litter sales increased 15%. Why? Because many of us expected more of our cats to stay inside. And sales of dishwasher salt went up too, by 138%. Not because we have dirtier dishes when it gets cold, but because some of us see it as a cheap alternative to clearing our frozen driveways. Unfortunately, the human swarm got it wrong again. Unlike rock salt, dishwasher salt doesn't dissolve snow. There was another surprise during the cold weather in January. One major department store reported a 50% rise in sales of swimwear. Virgin Holidays data showed an unexpected 40% rise in bookings in the same month. Although we responded individually to the temperature, the result was the human swarm was planning its escape from freezing Britain. Data also reveals another activity we do when the temperature is low. And it's something we look for 
online. Now, I'm already married, but one thing I find really interesting is that when the temperature drops, there's an increase in the use of online dating sites like this one. And the period after Christmas is the busiest, with some reporting a 350% increase in traffic. When the temperature drops outside, it appears that in the bedroom, the temperatures rise. The Office of National Statistics report 5% more conceptions in cold winter months. It is clear that a drop in temperature makes us change our behaviour in a dramatic way. When the temperature rises, there is a very different range of effects that alters our behaviour in a completely unexpected way. I've never sprinkled so much pepper. Ah. After the prolonged cold spell in February and March this year, the Met Office predicted warmer days to come. When the temperature rises, our biology responds, our behaviour changes. What is remarkable is that scientists can now predict these changes with absolute precision. They use Met Office weather forecasts and combine it with all the data we generate in our daily lives online and on social networks. Surrounding me here are the tools of what some might see as a surveillance society. My travel card reveals every journey I make. My credit card shows where and how I've spent my money. And sites like Google and Twitter record if I've been searching for flu remedies or if I've sent my friends a moaning tweet. It's the information provided by these cards that unlocks the secrets of our behaviour as a human swarm. On the 9th of April, the Met Office forecast that spring was on its way at last. They predicted temperatures would rise into double figures across the country. The supermarkets prepared for a major change in output. Four days before the weekend, this large factory in Cheshire is making food we prefer in cold weather. Supermarkets know if we get three warm days and the temperature reaches 18 degrees centigrade, a very large number of the human swarm will plan a barbecue. The factory is immediately instructed to completely revamp its output, ready to meet the new demand. The site manager is Andrew Walton. We're dealing with beef here now, aren't we? Yes. And this is all sort of lovely bits of meat, and this is what you call trim, isn't it? Yep. And how many tonnes of this will you deal with in a day? So on, on average, we're making between 60 and 70 tonnes of mince five days a week. What's going to happen with the mince here today, then? We're going to make this into burgers because we believe the weather's going to be about plus 16 degrees this weekend. Right, well, let's take it away. Weekend. So if we put that in, next is white onions. Oh yeah, lovely, right. Black pepper. Yep, I've never sprinkled so much pepper. How many burgers do you produce a year then? We usually produce during a cold weather week in the winter about 300,000 burgers, but in the summer it'll go up to 1.2 million burgers a week. The Met Office forecast for a warm weekend gives the supermarket complete confidence that there will be a huge rise in demand for burgers. Right, so, oh, we've got to be fast, haven't we? You've got to be fast. Faster than that. Jesus. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's slow up. <laughs> slow it up. Because I'm not as well practised as I should be, Jimmy. I know what it is, because you spend all your time watching the weather. <laughs> So, if the weather changes, how quickly can you change, then, from making mints to making burgers? Uh, with, within minutes. Minutes? It's as simple as that. Wow. 
If the weather forecast is correct, then the supermarkets have to make sure millions of extra burgers will arrive in the shops. Just as all us individuals come up with the same idea, to have a barbecue. In the distribution centre, Ross Eggleton has to make sure that as well as all the food, everything else we need for the barbecue is on the shelves ready for the weekend. About 50% of what we sell is, is fresh, so it's got limited shelf life on it, and in order to make sure that it's the best quality, it literally needs to come in and go out on the same day. Barbecue meat and salad from a UK supplier is relatively easy to source in time. But beer takes two weeks to arrive, and the barbecue itself will be imported six months earlier. So what we really need to do is ensure that they all come together for that one shopping trip when the person wants all of those items in their basket or their trolley. So while you're having your first pint at the first barbecue of the season, you know, think about us running around trying to get it to you. No chance. <laughs> On the 13th of April, the temperature rose, but only to 15 degrees, three short of the trigger for barbecue food. Luckily in the UK, we're an optimistic bunch. Across the country, we got ready. The supermarket sold twice as many burgers as normal. They also sold a staggering 400,000 extra salad bags and more of all the other things that accompany a barbecue. Gallons of tomato ketchup, and a mountain of charcoal. Data from the Met Office reveals that whenever the temperature rises above 18 degrees for a few days, our behavior can now be predicted with astonishing precision. More people walk or go into tourist attractions or to the beach. Um, and that can make a massive difference to the tourist industry, for example. But it also makes a difference for, for DIY stores and supermarkets. When temperatures reach a certain level, sales of fizzy drinks start going up. But eventually, if it gets very hot, people actually stop drinking fizzy drinks and they start drinking water again. In fact, when temperatures go into double figures, fizzy drinks go up by 22%. When they reach 20 degrees, sales of juices go up by 20% and garden furniture by 90%. During a warm weekend, we all swing into action. If you're like me, you tackle those DIY jobs you've been meaning to do for ages. This swarm to DIY puts 220,000 of us in hospital every year. And surprisingly, we injure ourselves in very similar ways too. Knives and scalpels are the third most common DIY accident every year. Surprisingly, stepladders are the second highest cause. They are responsible for some of the most serious injuries, even death. Amazingly, the highest cause of DIY accidents are splinters, grit, dust, dirt and other particles. They send more people for treatment and casualty than any other. On April the 16th, the temperature finally reached 18 degrees for the first time this year. It triggered a dramatic change in what we search for online. Google Trends is an internet tool that continuously logs all the words we search for and when and where these searches were made. And on that warm day in April, there were twice as many searches for mountain bikes. There was also a 50% increase in the search for the word pub. And perhaps in anticipation of warmer weather, the number of searches for tanning salons raised by 54% that day. This data is now available instantly and can give advertisers a tremendous competitive edge. Well, one company has developed a new method of marketing that can react instantly to our changing buying habits when the warm weather arrives. Bravissimo, like other clothing stores, change their window displays to attract customers to new products. How often do you change the windows then? Well, every season, all the new stuff goes in. Right. What we change it to? Lovely bikini. Bikini. Right. Yeah. So if we get our um, uh, things off, bra first. 
Oh. So she ain't got any. <laughs> why? Why hasn't she got any nipples? Um. I. Well, we don't really show her without her top on, so I don't really think details needed. And then okay, just give her a hug. Lift her up. There we go. Okay. Well, you pull the knickers off. There we go, darling. So when the weather changes, you have to think, right, OK, it's time to change the windows, put the stuff in that's going to sell. Yeah, pretty much. People might be going on holiday as well. And then you slide her back in the hole. Oh, where is it? Now, the top. That's not how you put right. it on. <laughs> Don't be tell. Oh, I've got it. Bingo. That's not a bad job, is it? Done. Well, that took ages to do. And even without my help, it is clearly slow and time consuming. We know when the weather changes, so do our buying habits. Imagine the effort required to replace the window display every time the temperature shifts. However, Bravissimo have a powerful new secret weapon. They have combined the very latest online technology with local Met Office data to launch a retail revolution. When the temperature changes by even small degrees, it activates biological triggers inside all of us. As a result, when companies combine the weather information with sales data, they are able to predict our behavior with astonishing precision. For the last year, a woman's clothing company have been using a new method of online marketing. Michael Flynn and his team have come up with a computer program that changes online adverts instantly whenever the weather changes. It is so accurate a company can target customers in any part of the country depending on the temperature or even when the sun comes out. We literally took the old big data approach, crunched all the numbers. What came out very clear was that swimwear sold, if the sun was out, January, February, whatever, you'd see massive increase in sales. So how do you do that online to make well, it work? Well, we built something called WeatherFit. So if we take a little look at it here. So as soon as the Met Office tells it's raining in one part of the country, that specific part of the country, the adverts will change. And we can see for Bravissimo swimwear, it can be very cold, cold, mild, warm or hot. We've got it ticked when it's sunny, so an advert will only come out if it's sunny. So if it's getting warmer, OK, I'm a 21-year-old professional lady. Yes. Um, what am I going to be buying? You'll be buying more dresses. In fact, the test study we did, dresses went up by 70% in terms of revenue. Just by matching up the weather conditions with, with the right advertising? Absolutely. And in terms of the swimwear, the increase was 600%. 600% increase in, in sales. Yeah. Do you know, if I was running that business, I would have bought you a big bunch of flowers and given you a big kiss, because that increase... Yeah, I'll it, take it, the flowers. <laughs> yeah, but that increase is massive. Exactly. Far beyond the high street, an information revolution now links us all. Retailers around the world can track us throughout the day, whatever we are doing. Gadgets like this wristband measure our activity minute by minute. It collects data from the users. It measures steps taken, calories burnt, and there's even a mysterious fuel unit. And the clever thing about this band is it talks to your phone, so you can share the information with your friends on social networking sites. And that really helps if you want that competitive edge. Oh, yes. The idea is to share your exercise regime with friends to encourage you to hit your fitness goals. It relies on our instinct to follow the crowd, just like a human swarm. The wristband collects a massive amount of data on people's global running habits. 11 million users have collectively run 890 million miles and burned more than 63 billion calories and taken over 43 billion steps since it started. The most popular song to run to was Pump It by the Black Eyed Peas. A global map shows where everyone is active and you can even share your routes with other people. There are other online sites that do the same for other sports. Now everything we do can be mapped.
the amount of data we produce in our daily lives has increased at an extraordinary rate. When this information is matched with weather records, it leads to an incredibly precise view of our actions. Social networks bring us instant feedback every hour of every day. I can totally understand how all of this can be seen as disturbing, how everything we do is collected as data. But when all this information is compared to weather patterns, it can really help us understand our behaviour as a human swarm. If you've ever wondered what a dust devil, fire, tornado or double rainbow is, you can find out with the world's weirdest weather, which is now available on 4OD. But tonight on 4, the police, ambulance and fire services being stretched by the British Las Vegas. What's your emergencies in Blackpool? Next. <laughs>